Great. Um, well, we're ready to get started. Thanks so much for joining us for today's uh, user group session. This is the virtual DB2 user group presented by iTech Ed. My name is Amanda Henley. I am managing editor over at planetmainframe.com, and I've been helping Trevor out with these user groups for about a month and a half now while he takes care of some things at home. And um, today he is uh, letting me take over and uh, present uh, Susan Lawson um, with you. So I'm excited to have you here. We have a, a pretty straightforward agenda. If you've been on uh, these sessions before, we're going to have um, our presentation, our introductions today. We're gonna do our presentation. There'll be some time for Q&A. Um, we'll talk about news and articles and um, talk about things that are coming soon. So you're welcome to drop your questions in the chat function during the presentation as they come to mind. Um, we'll get to them uh, once the presentation is over with. So um, don't be shy. Be sure to put your questions in the chat. And um, so let's see. I want to thank our partners. So uh, Intellimagic is one of our sponsors. I encourage you to check out all their GBT resources on their blog. And um, Planet Mainframe, my organization, is also a partner. We're a community of uh, mainframe content. So um, if you are interested in reading um, about, you know, DB2 and Kicks, we've got the articles over at planetmainframe.com. And um, I'll plug it in again. But since we are a community with a community publication, we're always looking for contributors. So if you've got a great success story you would like to share, we'd love to read it. Um, and with that, pretty straightforward uh, introductions, right? We're gonna move into our session. So um, let me introduce Susan. Uh, Susan Lawson is an internationally recognized consultant and lecturer with a background in DB2 ZOS, System and Database Administration. Uh, she works with several large clients on design, development, and implementation of some of the most complex DB2 databases and applications. She performs performance and availability audits and health checks. And um, you've probably run into Susan uh, in her work before because she's a, a fantastic speaker and presenter and very active in the community. Um, and she's an IBM Gold Consultant and IBM Champion. So Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, We're gonna... thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm gonna let you do your screen share and get you ready to go. Okay. All right, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, this presentation is kind of one that's been evolving. Uh, you may even have seen a version of it over the last few years, because I've been trying to keep up with all of the continuous delivery uh, function levels since version 12 came out. Um, and of course, now that version 13 is out, we are looking at the features of version 13, but we can't discount all of the features that have come out in version 12, did I say 11? Uh, in version 12 that um, have been coming out since version 16. And I, okay, there we go, finally advancing. Okay, so as I was saying, um, since uh, the announcement of version 12 in 2016, there have been several function levels. There's been uh, 10 different function levels, several APARs, and um, it's hard to keep up, especially if you're, you know, a data day DBA and programmer. You got your own issues, you know, and keeping up with all of these new features and functionalities, um, it's tough. So this presentation is designed to do just that. Um, I have made it my goal in life to um, make sure I'm up to date on every single uh, APAR that comes out, pres uh, function level, what's delivered in it that I can use personally, right? That a DBA or an application person can utilize. So not everything is in here, but everything that uh, we can get our hands around. So on the uh, right-hand side there, 
you can see the progression over the years of when each function level came out and um and uh you know and what's coming so we're right now in 2023 and we've got of course version 13 that came out last year but there's already already been one function level delivered uh that's 503 that was delivered in um uh, this year this year this past year in february i believe and 504 that's going to be delivered in October. So what we're gonna look at is all the different things, the opportunities, in other words, that some of these features bring to us. Because one thing about every new release of DB2, not just every new function level, but every new release, you know, there's things you can take advantage of, there's things you wanna stay away from, okay? And not everyone's going to see the same cost savings, the same availability um, features. Not everyone's going to realize the same functionality or same um, advantages, but you got to do your own testing. You got to look at your environment, what looks right for you, what makes sense for what you're trying to achieve. And hopefully I can give you some insight onto some of these features and where they can be used and where you need to actually be careful with some of them. So first of all, let's start with um, some of the, the stuff that, when it, that came out in 12 that was really key to the progression of version 12, um, the function levels, and on into version 13. And the first one being the relative page numbering for partition by range table spaces. This was a game changer because in the past, we had ran into limitations when building large table spaces. Right, we want to go over 256 partitions. We want to go over, you know, we want to go into the terabytes of data. We want to have large data set sizes. And there were limitations. And so that was holding us back because of absolute partition numbering. Well, those barriers were broken um, in version 12 when they introduced the relative page number. So that means there is no dependency on the data set size the DS size and the number of partitions uh, that you can have, as well as the page size. So that means we can comfortably grow beyond 256 and so forth. Um, so that was a big change. But we're not going to talk, we're not here to talk about that change specifically. But in version 13, starting in version 13, this relative page numbering is going to be the default. Okay, so there's of course a ZParm, the page num, page set, page num ZParm that uh, will be by default uh, relative. So it, it will be by default. And keep in mind, if you're not already here yet, um, you already don't have your data sets or you're not defining your data sets is enabled uh, extended addressability uh, you need to be, right? Because these this partition by range, partition by, um, uh, rel sorry, relative page number requires that you have extended addressability on your data sets. Uh, so here's just a quick look at some of the defaults that have changed in version 13. This is a look at an install panel if you've never seen one. Okay, this is where all of your defaults for your ZParms are set. So the one that I'm mentioning right now is number three down there, uh, page set numbering is now relative. Okay, so by default, it will be relative when you install version 13, used to, of course, be absolute. But there's a number of um, changes that have, have come in version 12 and version 13 where defaults are getting set differently. Okay, no longer are they being set at uh, you know, the lowest common denominator or the safest. They're being set more for the ability to exploit new features, the ability to grow, the ability to have better performance. So there's a, been a lot of that over the last two releases. And I will mention more of it um, as we go forward because there were some more changes in version 13. But this one here, again, this is something for you to be aware of. When you create a table space in version 13, your default seg size is gonna be 32. It's gonna be partitioned by range using relative page numbering if you're not specifying partition by growth okay so that's just something to be aware of now talking about performance with data sharing and partition by or, or relative page numbering um for partition by range data sets this is really not 
new necessarily. Uh, this has to do with false contention in data sharing when using role level locking. Um, it just becomes more prevalent with the uh, relative page numbering. And it all has to do with the fact that when you're using role level locking, um, even though you, you're taking a um, an L lock at a row level, if you have concurrent access to that page through, across DB2s in data sharing, you got to keep in mind that even though you're going after a different row, each application on a different DB2 subsystem, if those rows are on the same page, page level P locking still is there. And you're still going to have contention with page level P locking, and that causes um, what they call false contention, which is not a big deal. It just is overhead. And apparently it's more so due to the generation of the hash values, um, more so with uh, RPN, with relative page numbering, than it has been with uh, absolute page numbering. So in version 13, I mean, bottom line is behind the scenes, okay, this is nothing that we have to necessarily be overly concerned about because DB2 is taking care of this. It's going to introduce a new hash algorithm for page P locks, which probably will help us, you know, even if we're not utilizing um, RPN at this time, because uh, the hash value, the, the hashing value, the algorithm's never been perfect. So we experienced false contention before RPN, but uh, this new hash algorithm is going to help us across the board, really with um, a better hashing algorithm so that we don't have so much false contention. Just keep in mind, if you are using RPN, a, a PBR RPN, that uh, you will need to run a reorg if that table space was created prior to 12 in order to, I'm sorry, was created prior to 13, um, you will need to do a load or place or reorg in order to enable this uh, better algorithm for the, uh, the hash values. Now, this is a big one. Um, we knew this was coming, right? We, we've we got partition by growth and we've got partition by range table space types for a while. And in my opinion, um, I, don't, I still don't like partition by growth. People use them uh, a lot because it's easy. In my opinion, again, it's lazy because you don't have to have a, a, a uh, partition range value defined for good partitioning. You just simply let DB2 partition and grow your data and you really give no thought to your limit keys. And that, in my opinion, can lead to some issues. And that's what some people have found. So now we're wanting to look at, okay, I need to convert to partition by range. I wanna give some thought to my partitioning ranges, wanna be able to do you know, better distribution of my data values, have better sizing opportunities, have better free space, allocations according to how my data is distributed. Well, how do you convert from partition by growth to partition by range? Well, it's a multi-step process prior to version 13. And of course it comes with an outage because you have to load, unload and so forth. Well, in version 13 in uh, function level 500, which is you know um, fully functioning 13, then you can convert a partition by growth to partition by range with multiple impact. There is new uh, DDL that allows for this. So you have a new alter partitioning to partition by clause. Okay, so now, now you can take your partition by growth table space and you can start defining uh, limit keys for partitions. And you can specify the number of partitions you want, the uh, values of the partition key ranges that you want, and DB2 will do this through the alter table statement. So the conversion is immediate. If you have your data sets already defined, which you probably do, um, then of course, this is a change that will be materialized by a reorg. Okay, so now you're converting again to a partition by range. And of course, this will be a, a table space using relative page numbering because remember that is now the default <clears throat> in version 13. Another really cool feature that actually came out um, in an APAR in version 13 last year, around December, is to allow us to stack uh, pending changes. Okay, so let's say we're converting from partition by, by growth to partition by 
range. And we want to do some other alters. You know, so one of them that comes to mind, obviously, is DS size or buffer pool size, because now I have control over my size of my partitions. And I also have control over where my table space is going to go. And maybe I want to make some changes um, during this partition by range conversion. So before, you would have to do that in two steps. Okay, you would have to issue those alters, but then you'd have to have two reorgs to actually materialize those changes. And that can be a lot of work, right? Especially if you're dealing with large table spaces. So now this removes the stacking limits um, for those conversions. So you can stack certain changes. And as you can see there on the right-hand side, I've listed the changes that are supported uh, when you are doing a conversion from partition by growth to partition by range. And then, you know, as I was saying before, one reorg will materialize them all. Um, in version 13, another limit was lifted in a way, or actually a default was changed, I should say. I had mentioned early on, the first thing talking about today was the limitations um, prior to relative page numbering. And that was if you had a four, uh, 4K, page size and a 64 DS size, you could only go, growth could only be of 256 partitions, and then you had problems. Well, then, you know, things changed um, in version 12, where we could have, you know, a, a default, we could have different defaults or uh, different DS sizes and page sizes, and we could start to grow uh, but we could have problems if we went beyond 254. We went to 256, we get into the problems with not having um, our data sets again defined as extended addressability if we wanted to go beyond a four gig DS size. So in version 13, uh, the, the defaults change again just to keep some consistency in our lives. That's really all that feature is about. It's just simply that. Um, when you have a max partitions of 256 specified, your defaults will now vary from four gig to 32 gig, then depending on your page sizes. Okay, so again, a default that's changing, something to be aware of when you're creating larger table spaces. Increased number of open data sets. So DS max uh, is what we set uh, to limit the number of open data sets we can have. And that, of course, has been substantially increasing over the last few releases. And of course, where we stand now uh, in version 11, it went from 100,000 to 200,000. And um, it is increasing again. You know, the reason it's been able to be increased is because we're able to use more areas of memory. Uh, we're able to, um, you know, uh, have more memory to have these open data sets, have more data sets open concurrently. But the problem is, do you have that memory to support it? Okay, so this has been a problem anyway, uh, even before version 13. Um, so even though I specify 100,000 or 200,000 open data sets, I may not be able to support it. So a lot of people are still keeping those numbers low. Uh, the problem is when you keep it low, uh, if you want to have a lot of open data sets, when you start to reach DS max, when you get within 3% of it, regardless of your close option, close yes, close no, DB2 will start closing your data sets. Okay, so you still can experience some thrashing of opening and closing data sets for highly active um, data sets supporting your applications. And the problem we're seeing now more and more today is as we're getting into all this partition by growth and partition by range data sets, and we're having larger objects, larger table spaces, larger indexes, we need more open data sets than ever to support these applications. And we're still finding out we don't quite have the memory, we don't quite have the support we need for these large number of open data sets. Well, version 13 starts to move some of those control blocks needed, the memory needed for those open data sets above the bar, okay? Before it was still trying to use um, areas of memory below the bar. Well, now uh, some of that, those control blocks have been moved above the bar, opening up more opportunities to have more open data sets. 
So in the same time frame, uh, DS Max also increased from 200 to 400,000. So DB2 has this extra room now he can utilize to have more concurrent open data sets. And later on today, we will also see that uh, that same amount of that same area can also be used for other activity uh, activities, allowing for more concurrent threads. And I'll explain that later. But this allows us to increase that open data set um, limit again. But again, provided we have the memory to support it. And here's, you know, again, we're on ZOS 2.5 and where DB2 has moved those control blocks above the bar. Um, improved data capture. So another thing we see a lot of today in the last few years is a lot of data capture, a lot of QREP type processing or um, IIDR processing where we're replicating changes uh, from our DB2 tables for whatever reason. Um, might just be to populate a warehouse, might be to support a migration effort, all sorts of reasons. The problem is when you want to make changes to data capture, maybe you want to turn it off or turn it on. Okay, there's various reasons why you would want to stop your data changes being um, captured and then turn it back on. Okay, well, the problem with that is you can't, it wasn't real dynamic. You had to quiesce static packages and cache dynamic statements. So in a high availability environment, that's an issue. Right, anything you you know that causes quiescing of um, packages and statements can be problematic in a high availability environment. So in DB two thirteen, data capture no longer waits, so it's no longer going to quiesce your packages and your cache statements. It's simply going to run the DDL. Um, you can run su successfully even if you've got static or dynamic. DML running against the same table that you're altering. So this allows us to turn altering of data capture on and off much easier and in a uh, less um, invasive <laughs> uh, manner. Longer table names, or I'm sorry, longer column names. So we've seen this over the years where DB2 is trying to keep up basically with other platforms. Right, because other platforms have had longer table names, longer column names forever. And that tends to be a problem when we're trying to be compatible with other platforms, even other DB2s, right? DB2 on Linux um, and so forth. Uh, so now we're able to support longer column names. Because right now in version 12, you know, you were limited to 30 bytes of EBCDIC, okay? Um, and uh, version 13, you can support up to 128 bytes. Okay, so there's a new ZParm, again, that will be off by default in version 13. But if you turn it on, you can have column names greater than 128 bytes. So obviously you can use that in your creates um, of your table spaces, indexes, views. It can be used in your inserts, any of your DML and so forth. So now you can pretty much use it anywhere that you could use a column name. However, that being said, this is still the mainframe DB2. This is still, you know, we still have our own structures, our own quirks that other, other platforms don't. And one of them being the SQL DA. The SQL DA, if you were using that with something like Spoofy, QMF, um, TEP, TEP1, DSNTAUL, Declagens, none of those will be able to support a column name larger than 30. Okay, so they will only be able to recognize and return a column name up to 30 bytes. So be aware of that. That could create some limitations for you <clears throat> if you're trying to use column names greater than 30 bytes. Non-deterministic expressions for column auditing. This is a cool feature that actually came out in function level 503. And I believe this was right around 2020 or 2019, 2020 in version 12 and function level 503. And actually you can fit retrofit it all the way back to version 11. So this is the ability to track who, what, when, and where made a change to our column. And we'll do it within DB2 within the table. And I'm gonna show you the example because that's much easier than reading through that. 
So here I have a, uh, in this case here, I have a system temporal setup, right? Where I'm creating active data as well as history data to capture changes um, as they occur. Well, now I can actually capture who made the change. So I can find the current SQL ID of the person that made the change. I can then see what kind of change it was with the data change operation. So insert, update, or delete. And then, you know, of course, that will be captured also in my uh, history table, right? Not just my primary table, but my history table. And so then I also have the ability now to capture the deleted row. Okay, so we can say on delete, add row. So I can add the row to my history table if by chance that row had been deleted. So I get the who changed it, what type of change they did. So very nice feature that you can use, um, you know, especially this is very helpful with using system temporal setups because it helps you keep an even more detailed auditing trail of uh, what's changed. And in this case now also what's been deleted. Uh, here's a default that changed, <coughs> excuse me, in version 13 in function level 503, which came out in February. And this is kind of a minor default change. I don't know of a lot of people using this feature, the row change timestamp, but the row change timestamp is something we've been using for years to um, do optimistic locking, right? So you, you select um, a row, and then before you go and do a change update, you select it again to make sure that it hasn't changed and you compare a timestamp so that you are updating the data you saw before. So, you know, using a row change timestamp is helpful for um, optimistic locking. The problem was in data sharing, that default for row change timestamp was based upon an internal mapping between the LRSN, the log record sequence number, and a timestamp. And it could be a bit unpredictable because of the way this internal mapping table worked. However, in version 13, it's going to be more consistent because the new default is going to be in, introduced for rotating change timestamp columns. Okay, so it's just it's going to be a constant default, even data sharing, non-data sharing. It's no longer based upon that mapping table and that LRSN value. So it's a consistent static value for. Uh, the row change timestamp. So that's version 13, again, function level 503. Movement from segmented multi-table table spaces to um, an RPG in um, version 13 or version 12 into a, uh, moving from a single table space to a multi-table simple or segmented table space. So as you know, we knew this was coming. The day was coming when uh, support for multi-table table spaces was going to be deprecated. And we can no longer create them. They're supported, obviously, but we need to get away from them. And that's not easy, especially if you've been abusing multi-table table spaces by having hundreds, even thousands of small tables in these table spaces. But now it can be done a lot easier. So in the past, before function level 508 in version 12, uh, this was difficult to be able to move to a UTS. Okay, so, because um, you had to do it one table at a time, um, took a while, okay? And you had to run utilities and so forth. And depending on how many, this could, this could be a weekend for you. So in version 12 and 508, you've got an alter table space, move table option. So it moves tables from a multi-table table tablespace to a partition by growth table space. Okay, so you have a pending change, then you run the reorg, and DB2 moves the table to your new source single table table space. Now, this I'm making it easier than it sounds <laughs> right now. It is a multi-step process, all detailed out in the admin guide. Um, I've given you a few details in here though, don't worry. Some considerations, um, the recommendation is that you move to a partition by growth table space with a partition of one. That's been the recommendation by IBM. Also size it um, accordingly, and 64 gig should be enough, right? Because even if you're in a multi-table table space that's segmented, 
the limitation for the entire table space was 64 gig. And don't forget, you're gonna to have to rebind, of course. Now here's some, some things that I pulled out of the, the admin guide, just so that you're aware and you can kind of prep for this. Um, so moving, you first need to identify those table spaces that are holding multiple tables. If, okay, if you don't know them right off the top of your head, which you might, right? Um, you can find them. So that first query on the left there uh, allows you to query this table space and see if you can find, you know, the um, the table spaces that have multiple tables. And then if you want to find the tables in that multi-table table space, you could use the query there on the right hand side. And so that will allow you to identify, you know, both the number and the names of the tables that need to be moved. Now, how many should you move at a time? Well, that depends, right? Um, it depends on two things. You have the time it takes to actually issue the alter table move table statement. Okay, so you Okay, so that's cool, right, that you can do that. So it's no longer, you know, one at a time like it was prior to, um, shoot, prior to this uh, change. But you got to consider, you know, first of all, how long it's going to take for that to process, that alter table. So that's one part of it. And then you have to consider the time it's going to take to materialize it via reorg. So that's your second part then you have to worry about the time it's going to take for the reorg and switch for all shadow data sets. So in other words, you still want to do this in a um, slow period of time or, or slow time so that you're not interfering or waiting on other processes. Um, but again, plan for this. And the recommendation, of course, is don't do too much at once. You know, do this in small increments. There's no reason why everybody has to go at once. So move a few, you know, maybe 50, 20, 50 at a time. Okay. But just plan that out. And then don't forget your rebinds. So here's some queries that help you to um, find out who's affected by these types of moves. And so that you can, you know, organize reorgs um, accordingly. And of course, if you're afraid of, um, uh, you know, access path changes, you can, of course, mitigate that risk by taking some steps to plan, you know, get ready to run some run stats. Before you do your uh, rebinds, you might want to do it with AP reuse warn to minimize any access path changes. Um, again, plan for this. Don't just jump into this blindly because you are going to have to uh, identify and rebind those packages affected by the move table. So UTS partition by range row ID support. This came out in version 12, actually relatively early. I wanna say it was 2017 or 2018 with those APARs there. And we've had row ID support since version six. Okay, row ID is a 99.999% randomly generated number that is primarily there to support lobs, to tie a lob back to the base table, okay? But in version 12, they've decided to use this row ID to do partitioning. Because it's a 100% random number, people are using it for partitioning keys uh, across PBR table spaces because they don't wanna have to think about or implement a partitioning key. So if you don't have a partitioning key, you're you know, it allows you to um, distribute your data in a random fashion across partitions, even without a key. Well, again, I think that's lazy. If, if you can define a key, define a key. If I personally want to know the distribution of my data, I want to be able to do good free space analysis. I want to be able to do partition independence, you know, have utility independence, data sharing affinity routing opportunities, all kinds of things. But if you choose to have a random ID, distribute your data, go for it. What this feature is, is it allows you to hide that row ID. 
so that your applications don't see it. Okay, well, that's fine. But still think about, think twice about this. Um, you know, you might get some benefits of having randomly distributed data, you know, because maybe you won't be hitting the same data at the same time. But flip side of that is maintenance clustering, your sequential processes are gonna choke, your write IOs are gonna be more expensive, your free space is gonna be more expensive, index look aside is not gonna be as efficient and so forth. So weigh your options before you do something like this. But that is an option and as the version 12, you can hide. Faster partition by growth inserts. So the problem here prior to version 12 is that, you know, here again, it is another issue with partition by growth. Partition by growth, if you've been using them, they come with a lot of their own quirks. And this was one of them, where when you're trying to do inserts, if uh, your insert process could not get a lock and where it wanted to do the in insert, could not get a lock on the partition to do the insert, it would just go on to the next one and the next one. It didn't wait you know, for the partition, for the lock to be released. And it did not also go back and retry. So what would happen, it, was, it would get to the end of the chain and just fail. So now in version 13, uh, there's better insert algorithm, okay? So there's enhanced retry logic, first of all, okay? Because these typically aren't long locks. So there's no reason why they shouldn't just retry for that lock. And then also now they've introduced bi-directional searching for your insert. Okay, so introduces retry logic and retry and bidirectional inserts. So that should help your insert times for your partition by growth um, inserts. Improved index look aside. Index look aside is a key to performance in DB2. It's been around since version four, but it's had its share of limitations. So index look aside, you know, means that, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of inserts means that DB2 can look to the next page in the index, the next leaf page, to see if that's where that insert should go versus going back up the entire tree and coming back down to find a space for the index. So it worked very well, you know, for highly clustered indexes and so forth. That's where you got the biggest benefit and saved you a good number of get pages. The problem is up until version 13, it only worked for um, inserts and deletes, okay? Could only, and they were, they were the only ones that could use index look aside, as well as it only worked on the clustering index, as well as indexes that were highly clustered that DB2 could determine based upon catalog statistics, and hopefully your statistics were accurate. Uh, it was not supported for updates. Okay, so that kind of left out a few processes that could have benefited from this. Well, now you can use index look aside or DB2 will use index look aside for inserts, updates, and deletes. Okay, so that's gonna be a great benefit, you know, now for updates. And the even better benefit is that it's regardless of the cluster ratio or whether or not it's the clustering index or, you know, your statistics aren't up to date. So basically DB2 is gonna look and see after he does three inserts, um, if he can utilize um, uh, <laughs> index look aside, okay? And it will dynamically adjust, um, you know, if your patterns start to get random and he sees that it's not gonna be a benefit, okay? So DB2's got a little more sense and um, predictability on this to help you gain a better use of index look aside. Now, one thing you might hear as advertised, you know, that about this features, it's going to help with maintenance cost of your inserts, updates, and deletes. Well, what that means is it helps with the overhead that you've introduced by introducing an index. Maintenance means DB2's ability to take your insert, update, or delete and update the index. The more indexes you have, the more cost is associated with it, okay? So every, don't, don't think indexes are free. Every index you add to a table adds 25% overhead generally to, to your index for every insert, update, and delete. So the fact that you can have better index look aside is gonna help reduce that overhead. Okay, that's all that is. 
But here's the other thing. Think about your indexes. Don't have too many unless you need them. So let's look at uh, fast traverse block. This came out in version 12, okay? Function level 508 um, improved it. Okay, so version 12 brought fast traverse block into our life, which you know allows us to have a sort of index locuside functionality for random indexes. Okay, so when it has a little area of memory, right, where um, they save pages and it supports random indexes, so you can reduce your get pages. But the thing is, it you know it it it's had its share of issues. Um, it works well when it works well, um, but there's a few challenges with it. One, it is a version 12. It did not support non-unique indexes. Well, then with 508. Um, there's a uh, a change to that. Okay, you can support non-unique indexes. There is a Z parm that you can set to yes. However, you were still limited on the column size, uh, still limited to 64 bit bytes for less. However, version 13 comes along and enhances this a little bit more. Says, okay, we're going to make this the default first of all. Going to have non-unique index support be the default, so that Z parm is changed. And we're going to allow for unique indexes to be up to 128 bytes. Okay, so the uh, limitations have somewhat been removed for the length and the size of those indexes. However, that being said, you still want to be careful with FTB. I don't know if, if you've tried using it or not. Everyone's got different experiences with it. But in version 12, when it first came out, FTB was system wide. It was enabled system wide and controlled through, con or, I'm sorry, controlled by DB2 through automation. So basically, it was on by default um, in version 12, and DB2 would choose when and where and how to use FTB. Well, then, um, I mean, you could change that through the index memory control Z parm, but you know, a lot of us like to see you know what DB2 is going to do. You know, we left it at auto. Well, that became not not so cool to do anymore. So now version 12, they introduced an APAR that allowed us to say, uh, not for everything, but for selected index only, uh, turn that on by yes, and that is a new Z parm. And also in memory control was enhanced to say, do we wanna select the indexes? Do we want DB2 to select the indexes? And of course we can still use the um, index memory control con uh, catalog table to control which indexes can use fast traverse block and when. Okay, so we can do that. Um, we can control when DB2 uses fast traverse block or when it does not and which indexes it tries it on. If you're gonna try to utilize FTB, you know, make sure you're current on maintenance. Okay, there's all the APARs that at this time, uh, when this whole, when this whole thing started to change to be able to say selective indexes only, uh, there was a lot of APARs that came out and you know, IBM's recommendation was that you went towards index granularity. Okay? So that you chose the indexes that could take advantage of FTB, made sure all these APARs were on. So it's not on globally anymore and that you can control it through syscontrol through that catalog table. Okay, you can say force FTB creation, disable, or automatic per index. Okay, so that's something you might want to look into. Now, whether or not DB2 uses um, FTB, um, that's still debatable. Even if you say force, my understanding that's not even that's not really a guarantee. Okay, but if you want to see if DB2 got any benefit from it, there's also an enhancement, an APAR enhancement in 12 that allows you to do a display. And you can see the index traverse count. And that allows you to see the type of the usage of FTB, whether or not DB2 is actually using it. So that came out in um, May of uh, 21 to be able to get a better idea of how your uh, index look aside, I'm sorry, your fast traverse block is working. So another feature that came out in version 12 is the ability to support switching of tables. So in the past, let's say we wanted to have tables that were highly available. Okay, I wanna be able to 
make changes or do loads into a table, but I want to have my users reading a, another table. And then I want to be able to switch between those tables once all the updates are done to the original. So in the past, we had two different ways of doing that. Um, I like the mirror table approach, which is where you use two different summary tables that are identical and you have one process loading or updating or whatever to a, a one of the summary tables and then you do a switch behind the scenes you could do that in a query using you know using a left join uh, outer join um, process as you can see there on the right hand side and you can switch and it's transparent to the user they don't know that they're now reading updated data the other process that you probably are more familiar with is in version nine, we've got clone tables. Clone tables are great, right? Do the same thing. We've got clones of DB2 tables. We're updating or loading one table using all the users are reading the other. And then we issue the exchange and the exchange allows you to exchange between the base and clone table. Well, that's great, except that exchange causes an outage and that outage depends on two things, the number of partitions in your table space and the number of users. So what it's trying to do, that exchange tries to do is drain all those partitions before it can do the exchange. So if you've got a ton of users out there and you're not able to get a drain, that exchange could sit and spin for a long time. And that's not helpful for availability, right? Which is what we're trying to achieve here. So better option, here you go. Version 12, and actually retrofit back to version 11. Online reorg load replace. I'm sorry, online reorg share level reference for load. Um, what is it? Online reorg. Okay, so this allows us to have the same capability. So we can do a load replace share level reference on our load, which basically gives us an online reorg capability it introduces, you know, shadow data sets. We introduce a switch phase to the load, but it gives us a much more transparent um, ability to load data into one table and, and seamlessly switch to another. System temporal tables, um, system temporal tables and archive enable tables, they're nothing new, but the limitation for both of those with it was that you could not have a trigger. You could not reference a system temporal table or an archive enabled table in your WEN clause. Okay, version 12, function level 505, you can. <laughs> okay, so it's a pretty basic enhancement, but uh, a, a nice usability enhancements for you if you have a lot of system temporal archive tables being used. So you can now use them, uh, I'm sorry, you can now reference them in a trigger. Real-time statistics, uh, not much here except for uh, they, the data types in the RTS stats have been enhanced to be larger because we have to uh, account for more inserts, more updates, more deletes, right? So values such as reorg inserts uh, has been increased to a big int instead of an integer data type so that we can account for the billions of inserts <laughs> that we're doing. Log compression. So lob compression came out in version um, 12. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, version 12. Uh, came out in version 12. Uh, it was based upon the IBM uh, EDC Express card to be able to do this. This is a hardware-based compression. Okay, it's not dictionary-based like our typical table space compression. Okay, this is a good candidate for, you know, some of your documents, text, XML, and so forth. The difference in version 13, the improvement uh, comes with the hardware. Okay, so it comes with the Z15 hardware using the integrated accelerator for EDC compression. Okay, so using the integrated accelerator is going to give us better, um, pro get better um, performance for our compression offers lower latency, higher bandwidth. And again, it is good for um, good for, for text formats, PDFs, JPEGs, and it's going to have potentially a 70% faster compression in some cases. Again, it depends on what you're compressing and so forth. But that, again, version 13 
but it's also with the Z15 integrated accelerator. Transparent data encryption. This came out in version 12 in 502. Okay, this uses an encryption method that uh, various orders of encryption uh, are ways to encrypt. You've got uh, RACIF data set profiles, you've got key labels, you've got attributes on your SMS class. Uh, you must be extended in order to uh, be encrypted. Okay, so there's all kinds of ways to use encryption. You will need to have the use of the crypto processor in order to do this. Um, it, basically, you can implement it fairly easily. As a 502, you've got some DML support where you can define the key label as part of your create or alter or on your STO group. Okay, if any, you have any archive or history tables, those have to be done independently. And um, after encryption is enabled, then of course you have to reorg uh, your objects to get them to be encrypted. But some people have had very good success with this type of encryption. And again, 502 is when this was introduced, version 12. And in version 13, a uh, little bit of a uh, enhancement. I'm sorry, not 13, uh, 12, 505. A couple functions, built-in functions in DB2, allowing for encryption and decryption. Okay, so you can see in this first example here, we're updating our customer. We're able to specify a key label to allow us to um, update the protected customer in, a, um, in our data, in our data set. Huffman compression. So 509 introduced Huffman compression in DB212. And Huffman compression is just simply another type of compression. Not saying it's any better, any worse than the typical fixed length compression we have today. Keep in mind the tip, the fixed length compression we have today, or we've used forever, is just some, it's pretty basic, right? It's the, um, it's the Lempel ziv algorithm. You know, it's basically PK zip for the mainframe. <laughs> and uh, the Huffman compression gives us a little bit different options. And the only thing about the Huffman compression, so if you're asking me, you know, which one should I use? Should I use Huffman? Should I use traditional fixed length? Well, it depends. Keep in mind that Huffman compression does not support partial decompression, which is a feature that came out a few releases back, which can have an effect on a query performance. Because what happened is it, with this feature of decompression, selective decompression, DB2 would not decompress your data if you weren't selecting it, okay? Because otherwise it's operating on the entire row. But Huffman doesn't have the ability to do that. So you could lose a performance benefit from that. So just something to think about when you're comparing them. But if you wanna know who's gonna give you your best bang for the buck in terms of compression, use that DSN1 comp utility, okay? It's still there. Um, still waiting for you to use it. And <laughs> it will actually tell you uh, what your stats would look like uh, for fixed length versus Huffman versus uncompressed. Okay, so that's a new, you know, comp type all on DSM1 comp will give you those stats. Improved index look aside, I'm sorry, not index look aside, index page splitting. Index page splitting is terrible for performance, okay? And the problem is, how do you know when you index page split? Well, you feel it, okay? Your inserts start to slow down is basically the best way I can put it. And that's what, ha what happens is DB2 wants to split a page. You know, he wants to do your insert, but it's that next page is full. So he wants to split. Well, you know, he needs a new page to split into. And if that doesn't exist, he goes and starts searching the free chain and it can get ugly. But knowing is half the battle. And if kid 305, or sorry, if kid 359 came out, I think it was version nine, that allows us to have some information about index splits, okay? But you had to have this on, okay? It's enabled under trace class three, performs trace class six. It would give you the PSID, the member ID, start, stop, time, page number. Okay, good information if you had the stuff turned on. And it also didn't record, um, it wasn't recorded all the time. Okay, you had to have a total lapse time greater than one second for the split to have been recorded. So it wasn't capturing everything. Well, version 13, this is pretty cool. Starting in 501, RTS is gonna have stats on index page splitting. Yay, 
So now we get in the index space stats, we can see the number of times you've had page splitting since the reorg. I mean, it's not as detailed as the 509 if that's being captured, but it is certainly going to give us an idea of which indexes are experiencing page splitting. If we might want to get some reorgs into those guys or do some better um, job at our free space. Okay, so at least give us an idea of who's experienced a lot of page splitting and when they're experiencing it. So you'll know what processes are kind of influencing those page splits. Uh, deletion of old statistics. This is a run stats kind of a maintenance thing. If you're using statistic profiles in run stats, you know, it's important that you keep your run stats from becoming stale and inconsistent. And of course, over time, you know, over executions with different options and so forth, or even manual updates can cause, you know, problems with that. Um, so when you're using execute or you're executing run stats with a profile, you can do this and opt to delete the current statistics that are not part of the profile. So it allows you for a new way to clean up your stats. SQL and applications. So rebind, phase and rebind was the cool feature that came out in version 12 in a 505, function level 505, that allows us to phase and rebind. Um, so you've got a, you know, you've got a, a rebind occurring and you've got, um, you know, you need to be able to break in and that time is going to you know, probably time out, could be disruptive. It's a problem, right? So now we have a new feature that allows us to phase in the rebinds. So new threads can get a new package copy immediately. The old ones use the old copy. And then of course, this is that phase out process. Okay, so we're no longer waiting and we can all get our, our work done. Couple problems though with this. One, there was a concurrency problem right off the bat uh, that was fixed in 505. But the issue was, um, you, there was timeouts and package locks that could have been could have resulted. So transactions starting slightly after the rebind could experience slower time due to a timeout on the package lock. Okay, so this has been fixed. So this is kind of an internal problem that we didn't really need to worry about being fixed. So they fixed this internally, removing the conditional six lock. The other one is more interesting, which is, was a storage issue. Okay, so when we're phasing in these package copies, you know, doing this phased in rebind, so we're introducing more copies, which means we need more storage to store these copies. Okay, so this could become a problem when you start to, um, you know, especially in data sharing, when you're starting to acquire these uh, control blocks in ECSA, but they're not necessarily getting freed. Okay, so getting all these package copies and they're not getting freed. And the option there was to recycle DB2, which we're not gonna do, right? So in version 12 and 505, they modified the um, use of existing storage, which was one part of this. But in this subsequent APAR, there's a free package command now that allows us with a phase out option. So those packages that were created for a rebind phase, uh, phase in rebind, we can now free those packages from the catalog and directory and so forth. So it allows us to free packages and release that space. Um, profile tables, there's an enhancement to profile tables in version 13. And that is, it allows you to better control uh, release deallocate in version 13. Okay, I don't, if you're using profile tables, you'll recognize this, if not, um, you know, I'm going to go quickly over this, but if you're using profile tables for uh, better management, then you have the ability now to control the release package on, in a profile table. This is the one I wanted to get to because this is more of us that are going to have a use for this. And this is app, application granularity. When you are talking about locking, you have your number of locks per user and your number of locks per table space that are controlled by two Z parms right up there at the top. And they control the amount of time an application will wait for a lock before it times out, either by user or by uh, locks per table space. Well, this was set at the Z parm level. Okay, and you 
there was only one setting for the entire subsystem. Well, that may not work for all applications. So now you've got two built-in global variables that allow you to control these. Okay, these, well, first of all, there's two new ZParms that allow for specific setting for, um, I'm sorry, not ZParms, global variables that allow you to set these values for an application, for an execution of an application. And you would override what was set with the application, I'm sorry, with the system ZParm. So you've got your max locks per table space, which corresponds to the num lock TS, and you've got your max lo locks per user that corresponds, of course, to num lock US. <clears throat> and so you can set this specific, again, to your application needs that uh, you know will override what is set in the uh, system ZParm. Okay, so in version 13, we also have the ability, um, we can do a set current set, uh, current lock timeout value. Okay, so we have a timeout subsystem parameter that's new. And the max, um, we can set the current timeout. The default value is going to be negative one, which allows you um, to take the default. Um, and here's an example. You know, you can say in your application, set current lock timeout equal to 30, so 30 seconds. Okay, so this is another way to set the timeout value per your application. And this one overrides the 60 second timeout that is set by the IRLM wait time ZPAR, which has defaulted to 60 seconds since 1983. <laughs> so you wanted to change that ZPAR to begin with, but most people don't because it affects all applications in the subsystem. But this way we can at least bring that number down per application because there's no way you want your application waiting 60 seconds for a lock, okay? You want it to time out um, a little bit quicker than that. You don't want applications waiting. Deadlock priority, this one's kind of interesting because this allows us to increase our deadlock priority uh, so that we don't become the victim. Now, this one's gonna be fun because here I'm saying I'm better than you and uh, I'm not gonna be the victim of a deadlock. But here's why you might want to use it, because batch jobs that try to get in, you know, during a heavy application um, period often become the victim. OK, they, they fail. You know, their DDL statements fail um, instead of other SQL. OK, so other application SQL. So often batch jobs don't finish because they become, vic become victims of deadlock. Well, that becomes problematic, especially nowadays when we have competing windows of applications and batch jobs, you know, more and more, we don't have, you know, um, isolated windows for batch jobs. So, you know, we could introduce retry logic, uh, which is not often done. Um, we could do scheduling, which again gets hard because we don't have these windows anymore to schedule into. Well, here I can say, as a version 13, I can say, hey, I want priority. My batch job needs priority. I don't wanna become the victim. So there's a new built-in global variable called deadlock resolution priority. So it allows you to set a priority when you know, DB2 is trying to determine who the victim's gonna be in a deadlock. So the higher the value, you know, the less likely that application or that job will become the victim in a deadlock. Okay, so there's a new global variable that you can set to set this. So it's gonna be fun competing with everybody to see who, uh, who is not gonna be a victim. Uh, this is a feature that came out in 12. It's a new lock avoidance um, ZParm setting just to allow for lock avoidance on, a, um, on a, uh, a cursor with a singleton select. Now, this one's interesting because this has to do with above the bar storage. So as I, I mentioned earlier with the DS Max, uh, this also applies this, this movement of um, these local agents for threads to above the bar storage is going to free up a lot more space for us. So it's going to allow for, in version 13, a larger number of concurrent users. So statements with, you know, prepares and executes um, are now stored above the block. It optimizes also the interface between DBM1 and our distributed address space, okay, because that storage is also going to be uh, shared storage and will avoid the cross memory operations, which between distributed and DBM1 can be very expensive for high volume uh, distributed applications. 
So that movement of that storage above the bar uh, is going to help us with concurrent threads as well as distributed processes. And this is just kind of an example of how things build up. You know, before 13, you're doing these prepares. Um, you're trying to get storage for your uh, your SQL, which can be up to two meg, right? It's well, it is two meg when you're trying to acquire the storage. Then you've got stored procedures, which you know they want to allocate space also for dynamic SQL. And all that prior to 13 was above was below the bar, which is a limited amount of space. Now all of that, you know, again, this is all piling on one after the other, but now that all that is um, above the bar, it's going to actually allow for uh, more concurrent threads that are doing these types of processes. SQL, uh, sort performance with long ver cares. You have an order by. You should be leaving ver cares out of order buys, period. Okay, I can't stress that enough, but you're not, right? Well, here's the thing. A ver care column, even if one byte is used, and let's say it's defined at 255, it will pad to the full length in a sort. So stop putting them in a sort. It's making your sort keys and your sort work files long, and it, it, it creates problems for your performance, bottom line. So in version 13, they're going to check out exactly what you are using in that ver care column when your sort is being allocated, they're saying, oh, you're only using one byte of a 255 byte bear care. So DB2 is not going to um, allocate a file to hold all that. It's only gonna allocate storage in a word file large enough to hold what you are trying to um, really truly sort. So hopefully this is gonna save you CPU and save you elapsed time. But if things are fluctuating and change a lot, it may not. Okay, so again, your mileage will vary with this. List prefetch is now allowed in a merge. Okay, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Optimize, in version 13 and 503 in February, they you had the ability to support optimize for n rows on a select into. List tag is a function that came out in 501. I find really interesting because it is a built-in function that allows us to do a pretty cool kind of thing. Uh, let me show you the example real quick. And I promise you I'm almost done. Okay, so in 501, this list tag function came out and let's say I want to build a list. Okay, I want to build a list of employees by each department. Now in the past, we would have had to do that in an application process. We would have to define a cursor, get the employee's name, the department um, from the employee table, fetch data into the cursor, use some logic to find out what the employee, what department it's under, perform the concatenation and so forth. And anytime you do a lot of stuff like that in an application, it's gonna cost you money and it's prone to error and use of resources, extended use of resources. Well, listdag is a function that does the same thing. So here I'm saying select department and then get me all the employees within, you know, and group them um, by department. And then within that list, order them and concatenate them with a semicolon. Okay. And again, grouping by department. So you can see in the green box there, I'm grouping by department. And then in the employee list name, I'm listing out all the employees that belong to that, um, belong to that department. So I'm kind of horizontally listing all the employees in that department. And the IBM numbers down there, you know, they were talking 97% CPU reduction and, you know, and 94% elapsed time. And that's simply because you're not going in and out of DB2 and doing this in an application. You're doing this all in a built-in function in DB2. So it's a pretty cool feature. And in version 13, you got the ability to substring this list tag, okay? because it kind of had a little flaw where it would allocate 4,000 bytes <laughs> for that um, for the result of that function. Well, now you can substring it so that you can better minimize the amount of uh, storage in the work file that DB2 is trying to allocate for that list egg result. Hashing function came out in version 501. Only reason I mention it is because we've been using hashing functions for tens of years and you know, it's the ability to hash your data, maybe use it for, you know, security reasons, 
all kinds of reasons you hash data. Well, it's a 501, it's built into DB2, in case you didn't know that. And there's various versions of it that are out there, but um, DB2 provides a built-in function to do hashing. In version, 50, or in version 12 and 507, you have the ability to create or replace stored procedures. Okay, so you can reuse your original statements, make changes. Okay, so it doesn't require the old uh, way of managing stored procedures. This is a much easier, much less intrusive way of making changes to a stored procedure with the replace function. And SQL Data Insights, um, I'm just mentioning this because I can't do it justice in this presentation because it is a topic in and of itself. And it is the ability of having artificial intelligence um, functionality in the DB2 engine. And as I've mentioned a couple of times already, anytime you do something in the engine versus outside of it or moving the data outside of it, it's going to be uh, much better performing for you. And you can see down there at the bottom, there's three built-in functions that will allow us to you know, identify relationships and um, allow queries to infer hidden relationships between our data with various tables. So those are going to be three new functions built into SQL Data Insights, and they are DB2 built-in functions. You know, SQL Data Insights is quite a beast. Um, it is something you have to install. It is optional. You don't have to pay for it. It's not that. It just, it's just another whole kind of thing that you have to install and plan for for DB2, so it's not automatic. It comes with a GUI interface and all kinds of things, but you no longer need an ETL to move off your data to do AI type of functionality, or you don't have to have really complicated machine learning models designed by an expert. Okay, DB2 has that capability now. It was pretty cool stuff if you're interested. You know, There's a whole book on it, um, matter of fact, in the IBM manuals, DB2 manuals. And in summary, um, like I said, I've, what I've tried to do is keep track of the really usable features uh, that have been out since version 12. And in the function levels of 12 and in the function levels of 13, um, trying to keep track of usability of these functions where they can make our life easier <laughs> in many cases. But as you can see, also in many cases, then the warnings are still there that you need to test and plan for some of these features. They're not as magical as you'd like maybe for them to be, but um, it's good stuff. So I am in this presentation will be available for you. I'm going to give it to Amanda and she'll make it available for you. And um, you can take a look at it. And so all of these numbers and function levels will be there for you to reference. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we did have a question that came in um, during the presentation. Susan, I don't know if you want to read that um, or I can read it. I don't see it. <laughs> oh, read um, it in the chat? It's in the Got chat. Okay. Uh, I see it. Okay, we're going Yes, yeah, a uh, reorg will be necessary. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, Stephen Newton asked about regarding PBR with relative page numbering created, converted in DB2, DB212, will tablespace level reorg be needed in DB213? And that reorg is needed. Um, so thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but, um, oh, um, Susan, I'll let you um, jump on that one. Thanks, okay. Susan. Um, th this presentation has a list of references in the last slide. Um, that you could you could use. The question is, would like to check with you about getting resources. Um, same as for today's presentation. Uh, I've listed out a list of uh, resources, but of course, you know, Planet Mainframe um, also has a list, you know, of good resources for 
um, you know, again, like, just like for things like today. Um, but yeah, I, I would suggest starting with the, the IBM ex tech exchange community, uh, Planet Mainframe, um, and again, any of the IBM references books, which I have listed again in the back. Great. All right. Um, so uh, before we depart, we have um, a couple of articles. Uh, they are general news this month. So um, I thought there were some great statistics and numbers in the mainframe essentials article and the mainframe market. Uh, research was just put out about the, um, the mainframe market's growth. Um, so I actually, I believe that might be a typo and it should be billion by 2032. So please do check out those articles. You can snap those QR codes or we'll include them in the newsletter that you'll get uh, next month. Um, I've started featuring a job posting. Um, so there is a database administration specialist um, at Marsh McClellan Companies. Um, they are hiring for multiple positions if you, um, are looking for your next endeavor. And um, again, I mentioned that Play That Mainframe is doing a call for contributors. So if you've got a story you wanna tell um, to the mainframe community, we'd love to read it. We have everything from, you know, highly in-depth feature articles to um, getting to know you and your experience in mainframe articles. So um, if, you, if you wanna submit, you can, submit on that page or you can reach out to me. Um, I'm a Henley at planetmainframe.com. Uh, as far as getting involved and staying involved with DB2, so we've recently merged our Twitter accounts into uh, one account. So at mainframe VUG for virtual user group. Uh, so you can get all the mainframe user group information in one place. And um, we're doing the same with the YouTube channel as well. So um, on the YouTube channel, we post all of our videos, as you know, and um, we're reorging that right now. So you'll actually be able to find things a little bit easier. They'll be in buckets with tags and categories. Um, but I hope you'll come join us on the LinkedIn group. Uh, that's where you know we've got a place where we can have a little bit of uh, conversation and collaboration. And um, I would be remiss if we departed without me thanking again our sponsors, especially IntelliMagic, uh, for their support of the virtual user group. Um, so with that, thank you all for attending, Susan. Thank you so much uh, for participating and presenting for us today. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week.